Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, we'll just let people uh, enter into the space. My name is Amber Bennett, and I will be co-hosting today's webinar with Maria Granados. There we go. And uh, in case you are not in the right space, but you should be, this is the second annual What Do Canadians Think About Climate Change uh, report. And over the next hour, we'll be diving into some of the most recent public opinion polling on climate change and energy transition. And uh, we'll have some time for discussion and also questions. So I am joining you today from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. So that's the Siksika, the Kainai, the Pakani Nation, Sutina, Stony Nakoda, and the Métis Nation uh, Region 3. And I encourage you to pop into the chat your name, organization, and where you're joining us from as well. Uh, I'm super excited to say that we have people from all across the country joining us. We had 408 people uh, who registered for today's webinar, so that's even more than last year. And uh, we um, have everybody, you know, from across the country, coast to coast to coast, uh, Indigenous leaders, grandparents, federal policymakers. Uh, we've got academics, researchers, uh, activists, healthcare workers, union leaders, like there's a lot and I'm really excited to see the, the diversity of the interest. Um, we also have uh, our funders who I uh, want to um, provide a special shout out to to making this work possible. So the McConnell Foundation and the Donner Canadian Foundation and also a special shout out to Joanna Leffler um, and the Clean Economy Fund for making this work possible over the last few years. Um, also, uh, super, super excited to say that this year we'll be launching a new organization focused on climate communications at the University of Winnipeg. So uh, watch this space and uh, we'll have more information about that coming out soon. Um, so once again, for those of you who are just joining, please feel free to pop into the chat your name, organization, and where you're joining us from. Uh, so today's webinar, it's an hour long, and uh, we focus on this work, we focus on the research part because there's a lot of excellent research that's happening across Canada. But obviously communicators don't always have time to synthesize that or keep track of it. So part of this work is really about um, you know, bringing it all together for you to, to bring it into one place, uh, see what it says, see what it doesn't say, and offer some recommendations based on that. Um, I'm also, uh, we have really three excellent senior uh, communication strategists on today's panel. Uh, so we have the lead author of the report, Chris Hatch, who is a strategic consultant on energy and climate change. He's the former executive director uh, for Canada's National Observer, where he writes a weekly net uh, newsletter uh, still called uh, Zero Carbon. He's previously the executive director of the Rainforest Action Alliance and has a background in campaigns and strategic communications. Uh, we have Kara Pike, who's the founder and executive director of Climate Access, a nonprofit focused on building political and public support for climate solutions through its learning network for nonprofit government leaders, activation and engagement models, and strategic framing and narrative development projects. She regularly advises government agencies and nonprofit organizations. And finally, we have Natalie Southward. Worth, uh, who is a strategic communications uh, consultant to environmental organizations across Canada for close to 20 years. She has helped craft and popularize messaging while driving communications campaigns that influence decision makers, investors, and voters. Prior to her comms career, she worked in various capacities as a journalist, um, as a documentary film producer, freelance writer, and a full-time reporter at the Globe and Mail. So please uh, welcome them. Um, Chris will share an overview of, uh, of the report findings at the beginning. Carol will offer some recommendations and then we'll open it up for a, a panel discussion and then finally uh, finish off with some Q&As. So just, uh, I don't know if we need any ground rules on Zoom any longer, but just in case, uh, we'll be using the Q&A function today. So we'll be using those um, to collect your, your questions. I know that we have quite a few of the um, pollsters 
or people who, whose work we're actually citing in the report. If you see um, any questions about specific to your research, do feel free to pop in and uh, answer those. So that's an invitation to, to any of the, the pollsters or the researchers um, if we're citing your work. Um, finally, uh, we will share the, the report and a copy of this presentation at the end via uh, email. And um, uh, yeah, so that's it. So please continue to keep introducing yourselves in the chat. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our colleague, um, Maria, um, who I believe will be opening up some polling. Thanks, Amber. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to kick us off with a little bit of climate opinion trivia just at the beginning. So I wanted to share three questions from the findings that we have this year, and I want to kind of test and, and see where you're at and, and uh, how on the nose we might be. So I'm going to open up the polling here now. So it's just three questions. You might have to scroll down to answer. Um, I can see when people are participating. Um, can everybody are you able to see it? All right, I see the answers starting to come in. And then um, I'll close the poll in about a minute or so, and then I'll put the answers um, in the chat as Chris is presenting uh, and diving into the, the findings and, and what those mean. Awesome. While you're doing that, I can see we've got folks here from all over um, Climate Change Canada, Climate Fast. Uh, we've got City of Vancouver, uh, Pemina Institute, City of Calgary. Uh, we've got the Buta Family Initiative uh, on Canadian Seed Security. Jody Stark from David Suzuki Foundation. It's really, there's, this is awesome. All right, I see that most people have participated in the poll. I'm gonna give about 10 more seconds. And I think, I think based on the answers that I'm seeing come in, you'll be, you'll be surprised uh, by some of these findings. So I'm gonna close the poll now. And I am going to share uh, the answers, like I said, uh, in the chat as we go. But um, with that, Chris, I will let you uh, take it away. That's great. Thanks, Maria. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get into some of the findings of the report here. Okay, so what we've done and what you're going to hear about today is that we basically looked at all the publicly available polling out there um, taken over the last year up until a couple months ago. And we were also able to get into some unpublished research, thanks to many of the researchers on the call, and able to check it against subscriber-only research. And what we want to give you is a sort of broad overview of the patterns and the important trends in climate opinion. Um, we're not looking to get into you know, details and crosstabs here today. We want to um, just, we're, what we're hoping to do is just give you some ideas about where you can lean in as climate communicators. Um, last time we did a roll up on public opinion research, we looked particularly at the huge muddled middle, what we call the movable middle of um, Canadian public opinion, of the Canadian public. These are folks who um, think climate change is a big problem, um, but mostly are thinking about solutions in terms of recycling or plastic straws and that kind of thing. This year, um, we did the deeper dive into what's called collective efficacy whether Canadians think um, it's possible to tackle climate change, how effective the solutions on offer are, that kind of thing. Since that's such a big, important um, area for climate communicators, that's a place where we um, play a really strong role. 
So um, let's dive in. I'm gonna start by looking at some of the trends that are helpful um, to your work, kind of the tailwinds in public opinion. Um, we know, and I'm sure you've all heard um, lots of times that three quarters, sometimes even more, depending on the poll um, of Canadians are worried or very worried about climate change. Um, and what we're seeing um, is a very significant trend here where that's um, crystallizing. It's crystallizing at the very concerned end of the spectrum. Here on this slide, we're looking uh, not just at people who are worried about climate change, but are saying this is a very serious threat, you know, given the options of a little bit serious, moderately serious, you know, serious, very serious. And what you see, you know, on the red line, for example, is Angus Reid um, between 2015 and um, the end of last year, a rise of 35% to 50% who say it's a very serious threat. One of the big um, drivers behind this is um, extreme weather. Um, last summer, especially in British Columbia, a series of um, you know, awful heat waves, fires, then floods, and um, Abacus um, was out in the field testing how people were responding. And um, what they found is that in the course of just a few months, um, one and a half, a million more Canadians, the penny dropped. They realized that climate change is having a direct impact on us personally, on our health, than just a few months earlier. Um, so climate change is rising in concern and becoming more immediate. Extreme weather is sort of a complex factor. We get into it more in the report, but the overall trends are um, pretty clear and um, obvious for climate community communicators to lean into. We also um, see a very encouraging trend in the public's vision of where the um, sort of future of energy lies. This is actually quite a stunning finding um, in public opinion terms. Um, basically a 20 point rise over the last year or so in the percentage of Canadians who think that clean energy is going to be very important to our economy 10 years from now. We know um, also that um, over 70% of Canadians now say that a clean energy transition is inevitable. So like it or not, um, that's how they're seeing um, the future. Very strong um, implications, of course, for all of us when you can frame things up in terms of um, where the future lies, you're standing with the um, great bulk of public opinion. These are overall trends, of course. They aren't distributed evenly across the population. We're not going to dive in detail here um, today into particular audiences. Um, you can get that um, out of the report. Um, you know from previous webinars, if you've been with us, that women are a super key um, audience. The basic regional patterns um, have stayed pretty much the same over the last year and so. Um, the one huge divide, which probably won't surprise anyone on this call, is um, political. There's a huge political divide in Canadian public opinion. And I want to show you just one slide because I think it really shows just what crazy primates we are. If you self-identify as left-leaning, um, 86% of you think that extreme weather has been getting more severe. If you self-identify as politically right-leaning, um, less than a 50-50 chance that the weather you see outside your window and is impacting you personally is actually registering as um, you know, climate-driven extreme weather getting worse. I wanna look at some other complicating factors. A lot of these have to do with the kind of macro environment that we're living in right now. Um, a lot of trends in the bigger environment are um, extremely difficult for long-term work, um, working on the greater good, working for collective action. The question on this slide is about how easy or difficult it is to feed your family. 57% of Canadians um, now say, it's difficult 
This is a very significant rise up from 36% in 2019. And this is the kind of question that gets right to the base of um, you know, the hierarchy of needs. So it's not surprising that when Canadians are forced to choose between jobs or the environment, the number that are now say, you know, we should protect the environment, that's dropped below half for the first time in several years now. There had been a pretty strong trend, um, which has reversed just in the last few months. And, you know, you can look at the dates on this chart, things are actually probably even a little bit worse today. And there are other serious headwinds in the macro environment. Um, as you know, there's real energy behind a kind of anti-climate um, right-wing populism, of course, the war in Ukraine and the implications for energy. There's also a really big um, decline in social trust. People are just less trusting of governments over the last few years and other institutions um, across the board. It's a huge um, problem um, for collective action pro projects. It's not a Canadian phenomenon, it's happening globally. Um, but I do wanna, we do wanna point out that there are, is one big group that stands out against that trend and that's scientists. When you look at the data um, coming in around social trust, the messengers, the source of information that has been pretty much unaffected while everyone else has dropped a lot is scientists. And, you know, obviously um, big implications for um, messengers, message in terms of climate communication. I wanna move now to um, another factor that's super important in the sort of background of um, climate communications, and that's um, the public's um, demand for action on climate. As we talked about, three quarters of the public or so say they're quite worried about climate change. Now, what we see in this slide is that when they're asked outright, two thirds of the public say government should be doing more on climate, right? But if you ask, um, dig beneath the surface a little bit, you find that Canadians are actually pretty satisfied. Ask them, is the government doing a good or acceptable job? And you get about the same kind of response. About two thirds of people think we're doing um, a good or good enough job already. Um, the trend here is actually quite worrying. Demand for action has declined by 10 points over the last five years. This is um, you know, Eric LaChapelle at the Université de Montréal, who has been studying, tracking these questions over years. Um, we can get in maybe in the, in the um, discussion later about why this might be happening, but it's important, I think, to realize that um, the high levels of concern the um, increasing trends in positive trends in terms of vision of the future are not actually um, reflected as much as you might think in terms of how much the public is demanding action from governments. Another way to get at this question is to ask whether people think Canada is doing its fair share compared to other countries. Just 25% say we're doing less than our fair share about 41% say we're already pulling our weight. Now let's move um, to some of those positive trends again. Um, how are Canadians thinking about clean energy, fossil fuels, their vision for the future? The really important thing to know is that clean energy is wildly popular. When you're communicating on a clean energy vision, the public is strongly with you. Um, numbers like 92% are virtually unheard of in public opinion research. And this is true across all democratic, demographics and across all party lines. It's the one issue really that in, in the climate space that really jumps out in that way. It's not divided um, nearly as much by conservative versus liberal as um, all of the other questions are. We also um, touched on um, just a moment ago that Canadians think the transition is inevitable at this point, a clean energy transition. 
And a majority now think it will be a good thing economically. You see that on the bottom bar there, where there's more op economic opportunity than risk now stands at 56%. And the important thing to know is that these positive attitudes are trending strongly at, um, in a positive direction. We looked at this slide just a moment ago, but that's a really big jump in a very short period of time. Those, those trends are um, real tailwinds for us as communicators. Now we'll move to looking at the trends in opinion around um, fossil fuels like oil and gas. We saw in that last slide, if you were looking through the results, that there is still a very large majority, 70%, think oil and gas will be important to our economy um, in 10 years. This slide shows the trend over time. We're seeing an erosion in support for oil and gas development and an increase in support for taking measures to restrict oil and gas development. Basically a 10 point shift over the past three years. It's not earth shaking numbers, but it's a very clear trend. And you hear the argument a lot that we should be expanding our oil-based economy to finance the transition to renewables. Today, only one third of Canadians agree with that argument. And their trend is similar um, on that point as well. Since 2019, there's an eight point rise in strong disagreement that we should expand the oil economy to finance the transition. Digging in deeper, opinion on fossil fuels get even more interesting. We don't have time to really dig into this, um, but what you see is that um, fracking has become incredibly unpopular. There's support for fossil fuel development only really among conservatives anymore. These numbers among liberals and NDP and other parties um, were pretty surprising to us really. Angus Reid came out of the field um, and this was their conclusion. Among non-conservative past voters, there's little enthusiasm for any form of energy beyond wind and solar. Coal, by the way, is just barely registers on the charts anymore, even for conservatives, less than a third support um, expansion. We're gonna move to um, collective efficacy um, in the last bit of time here. This is the bundle of attitudes around whether people believe it's possible to tackle climate change, and if so, whether it's possible to make that happen. And um, it's pretty sobering. You get 50-50 um, answers on whether we're doomed. So we've got a real issue with fatalism to deal with. And again, the trend is crystallizing um, of the public opinion. The percentage who strongly agree that it is probably too late that percentage has doubled since 2019. And you also see doubt, um, ineffectiveness, lack of literacy about solutions in these results. It's pretty striking, I think, to see that just 44%, less than half of Canadians think transitioning away from fossil fuels would be very effective at reducing carbon emissions. And in other findings, just 35% think improving public transportation would be very effective. And despite whether the um, solutions on offer are thought to be effective, there's very little trust that government will get it done anyway. Just 35% have confidence that government will create policies to cut carbon. Environics came out of the field um, looking at a lot of these questions. And this, is, this was basically their finding. We really need to build a sense of momentum among the public that there's something that can be done here to avoid a you know, spiral of self-fulfilling prophecy around fatalism and inefficacy. So um, where do Canadians, we're gonna talk a lot in the discussion about um, providing tangible examples, giving people kind of earworms that um, lodge in their minds and that give them a picture of the pathway forward that this can be done. Um, but I want to show you one last slide um, in terms of where Canadians are predisposed to believe the examples of progress that you provide. Um, it's not the United States and China. This might be surprising because the United States has actually been reducing emissions over the last 10 years where all ours have been going up. But Canadians are predisposed to believe um, examples of solutions coming from here at home. 
64% think we're doing a good or very good job of dealing with climate change. Um, and even better from European countries, where 70% of Canadians, um, so people generally think um, the Europeans are out in front. So where you can provide um, foreign examples from there, they're likely to be believed. So just to sum up, um, we're facing um, pr some pretty serious headwinds around efficacy and fatalism. Um, demand for action lags behind concern. Um, people do not yet really have a picture of the pathway, the solutions pathway, and um, doubt that many of the solutions would be effective anyway. So that's a big area um, where climate communi communicators can play a big role. And of course, this larger um, macro environment that we're in around economic anxiety, um, declining trust, and those issues that we discussed. But there are very strong tailwinds for you as communicators, a crystallizing of concern. Um, people are connecting the dots around extreme weather. The vision for the future is generally trending in a very positive direction. And there is a, you know, very significant and notable disenchantment with fossil fuels happening among the public. So that's the brief overview I wanted to give. I'm gonna hand things off now to Kara Pike, who's gonna take you through what this means for climate communicators. Great, thank you, Chris. And uh, I just wanted to mention that we put out at the end of 2022 a guide for how to communicate with Canadians about climate change and an energy transition. So um, that's something to, to refer back to and uh, that I'll be drawing from. Uh, so what do we do? What do we do with all of these trends? What are some ap applicable approaches? So Chris, if you want to move ahead in the slides, um, looking at this in terms of uh, message triangle. And this is based on narrative best practices that you need to make the challenge clear. And we did get some questions in advance from participants. So thank you for that. And one was around, how do you sort of create a, a sense of urgency and sort of elevate the concern? And, and that's important, but you really have to connect it to that pathway, what can be done. Uh, and then what are the benefits of taking that action? Of course, uh, needing to think about tailoring your audiences, um, tailoring for different audiences. You could hear from what Chris presented that there are distinctions um, depending on who you're trying to reach. But in general, uh, really making clear that the challenge um, is that we have this economic energy and climate insecurity all happening at the same time. Uh, and that scientists agree, it's really fossil fuels driving the problem and we can't have any more expansion. And for Canada, that's really important because that's our biggest emissions category. Um, and uh, if we don't get on top of it, the extreme weather that we're seeing is only going to get uh, worse, that now's the time so we don't see more cost to lives, our communities, our health, uh, and cost to recovery. Uh, in terms of that pathway, again, you wanna tailor, but we do know some of the big things that we need to do is we need to power our buildings, our transit and our communities with clean, affordable, renewable energy. And we need to take steps to prepare for impacts, including uh, ensuring those most at risk uh, can respond. And, and I think part of it is the choices around, do we wanna continue being one of the biggest subsidizers of uh, fossil fuels in, in the world uh, or take our public money and resources and our efforts and actually make access to clean renewable energy for Canadians and an option for all. And I think there are a lot of benefits. I mean, right now around, you know, the economic and conflict volatility with Ukraine, uh, a conflict driven by fossil fuels, um, the health risk. So once we move away from them, we're, we are going to see uh, health benefits. We're going to see savings. Renewable energy is uh, the more affordable choice. 
Um, energy access, you know, there, um, energy poverty is actually impacting a very large percentage of Canadians, either uh, having big energy costs burden them, uh, not living in places where they can actually retrofit and make comfortable, or remote northern locations where they're still diesel dependent. So this is about, you know, um, benefits that actually will make people's lives better and get on top of the climate risks. Um, but I think there's also a piece though around making a difference. You know, we have a choice here. And one of the benefits is that we actually uh, can step up and do something that will be significant at this time. So moving ahead, just to pick up on a few more of the trends that uh, Chris mentioned, um, really wanting to, if you wanna to go to the next slide, generate that sense of momentum um, you know, this transition is underway, but we need to elevate it. It's hard to see change when you're in the middle of it, and particularly when some of the things that are happening are behind the scenes. So I think we really want to illuminate and amplify the changes that are underway and the benefits of that. So, for example, we don't even have to look to uh, Europe necessarily when you see British Columbia has the highest rate of adoption of electric vehicles in North America. And uh, with the new federal budget and climate plan, uh, the opportunity to, to make that reality uh, available to people when EVs are actually the cheapest option for driving now. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think there's examples like in the States, the Green Building uh, Council does a very good job of like embedding, like this is a green building and this is the level of it. So really, thinking about how do we start to amplify, whether it's through signage or stories, uh, this change is underway. Addressing that affordability, um, highlighting examples that now the LEAF is the cheapest car to get into and operate available on the market. Uh, and then painting that picture of the solutions pathway. What are the steps that we really can take? And I think this is where, um, it, you know, it's tricky because, uh, it's not going to be an immediate move away from oil and gas, but again, the, the science is clear, uh, whether you look at the IPCC or the International Energy Agency that we can't actually have um, expansion of fossil fuels. So it is a confusing time right now when we are approving new projects like Beta Nord and at the same time trying to take other steps. Uh, so that the picture of the solutions pathway is really about moving away from the source of the problem to that clean, renewable, affordable, reliable energy for all Canadians. So those are some thoughts uh, on what to do with this, but we're gonna dive into that further. And maybe Maria, if you wanna go ahead and uh, spotlight uh, all of the panelists' videos and Chris will take down the slides. Uh, what we're gonna do first is go into a number of questions um, that we put together, but also that were sent in. Uh, again, thanks for that, doing that in advance. Um, and then we're gonna open it up because there are questions coming into the Q&A that uh, Maria and Amber are tracking and we'll weave into the conversation. So I wanna start first uh, with an easy one, uh, Chris, for you, which is really around, you know, when you look at the 60 plus research sources, summed up in the report, uh, where did you really see gaps where we might wanna be thinking about expanding uh, the research work happening so we're better informed? Yeah, well, I mean, there's some specific things um, where you see a big difference between um, Canadian and the American um, research where we know up here um, a lot less about specific um, audiences that we know are actually highly climate motivated. Um, new Canadians, for example, and specifically how they're thinking about things like in the States, we know a lot, for example, about Latinx um, audiences, highly motivated and campaigns have been organized um, to um, mobilize um, those audience specifically. But I think the big thing that really jumps out is um, we don't know nearly as much as we need to know about the solutions pathway and how people are relating to um, 
this energy transition where the big leverage points in terms of the public conversation are, um, what you know the best language is for various audiences um, to be talking about this kind of thing. There's a huge amount of research that gets done that's actually kind of duplicating itself. Um, and um, I would say what we'd hope to see over the next year is more research um, really digging into that solutions pathway and how to lay it out for the public. That's great, Chris. And I know Dr. Louise Camo is uh, with us today and is doing some really important work around the electrification conversation. So Louise, if you have any thoughts or tips you wanna um, add into the chat, that'd be great. Uh, so, you know, we looked at 2021 public opinion, but things are moving so quickly now, such a time of volatility and great uncertainty with the war in Ukraine, and we're seeing opinions shifting as well in terms of uh, Canadians' role as a global provider of oil and gas when there's a need to get off of Russian fossil fuels, um, the economic concerns uh, that Chris talked about, price at the pump, inflation. Uh, so I wanna go to you, Natalie, and get your sense of how do we make the case now for strong climate action, um, in particular when we are hearing, hearing calls for expanding oil and gas, and we know that's not the right choice to be making. Great question. Um, I think, first of all, we have to um, be very honest with the reality of the situation, and that is, and lay that out first, and that is, despite industries ramp up calls for more um, you know, pipelines and LNG terminals right now to help support Europe's um, move away from Russian gas, Canada actually isn't in a position to help Europe get off that gas from Russia. It just isn't, it's a myth. It takes many years to um, ramp up um, and build the, this infrastructure uh, like terminals and such. So it's really, um, an unfortunate, uh, but not at all unsurprising um, move that industries made to make it, you know, case for more oil, uh, Canadian oil and gas during this devastating time in Ukraine. Um, and it's very opportunistic. Uh, but that said, the gas, uh, we do not have the kind of fossil fuels to supply to Europe anyway. So that's important because it immediately sort of grounds everything in reality because it's, it's just not possible. And even Minister Ebo said that much uh, to media, and there's been several opinion pieces on that. So it's important to repeat that. Um, but in terms of focusing away from that expansion that industry is pushing for, and some in, I would say, the federal government are definitely also advocating for, um, I would recommend focusing on the fact that Europe is committed to getting off gas and has said so from Russia by two thirds in this year alone. And it's ramping up its um, uh, renewable energy and its green transition. So th the reality is Europe stands right now as this great model for the world and Canada should be following suit rather than trying to perpetuate the world's reliance on fossil fuels using this war as an opportunity to do so. We should be um, raising our climate ambition and doing similar things to what Europe's doing, uh, because we all know that this war is very much um, caused by fossil fuels to begin with, and this destabilization of the world um, that will be, will be ongoing if we continue to perpetuate. So not sure if that gives a full answer, but um, I do think we've got to ground the situation in reality first and then pivot to what Europe's doing and show that Canada needs to do the same. Chris, anything you want to add on that? Well, just that I, I, I think I think where we get in trouble is when we lose um, the broader context and trends that um, are favorable to climate action, and we end up arguing um, not on a field um, that's framed correctly. So I would just say, you know, in all of this stuff, the it's really important to go back to that triangle that you were laying out earlier and make sure that whatever the conversation is, we're reminding people that it's, you know, the larger context, you know, is climate change, the vision of the future that Canadians already agree with, and okay, let's have a discussion about what to do about Europe. 
um, but within that larger frame. Because where we get lost is when we start, um, you know, having arguments, having a, um, you know, the national conversation, divorced from um, the larger issues and trends that the public is hugely supportive of. So I think it's really important always to go back and trigger those values and vision um, as the context for the conversation. Yeah, and I, yeah, thank you, Chris. And, you know, with the point made earlier, just about one of the big takeaways from the report being the lack of clarity around the solutions pathway, I mean, in many ways, it's not surprising, right? When you, we have a government who in many ways is stepping up and doing great things like putting a price on carbon, investing more in EV infrastructure, but we're not actually addressing the root of the problem. And we're building out the um, building out more of the problem despite report after report after report saying there's no room if we actually wanna not go over the edge with climate change. So I wanna get both of your thoughts on how do we hold these things? Like how do we uh, sort of elevate the successes and what is working well, while at the same time holding decision makers accountable for the areas that we still have the blind spots around. So Natalie, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I mean, th this is, I think, the number one issue facing climate communicators is actually how words like clean and green energy have been co-opted uh, by industry and, and others. And um, it's a real problem. It's very confusing right now for Canadians. It's very confusing for most of us to understand, you know, if, if you're not in the weeds with climate and understanding all the various components, you know, it sounds actually quite reasonable what industry often puts out which is, you know what, we can't get off oil and gas tomorrow. No one's saying we can, but that's what they say to sound reasonable. That, and we need to have a transition plan and we need these, you know, bridge fuels to get there, which include, you know, such things as blue hydrogen, which actually is a fossil fuel. So, but, but it's all so um, much, and it's about a year and a half of this in, the, in, in communications that I would say that this has been sort of developing um, that, I think the really the only way to other than and again you've got to really understand who you're speaking with when you're a climate communicator so if you're speaking to decision makers and government and policy analysts and scientists and that kind of group um, very important to go into the weeds very important to say what exactly are the myths around this idea of green oil and how that's just not actually even feasible um, so, so it's very important at that level that we have those details. But for the general public and for Canadians, no, that, that's gonna, given all, the, all the, that wonderful presentation that shows, you know, where we're, it would just be, I think, a waste of communications time to try and parse out different definitions all the time. And it, we'd be using that space poorly. I think the best way to use that space is to actually talk with more detail about the renewable pathway, uh, real clean energy. And I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to do more with that than has been done to date. Um, for example, and I'll just say two more things, industry does a great job of showing its bricks and mortar reality for its pathway. You know, it shows uh, projects that it's, that it's developing and it's new technology. And, you know, almost daily, you see something out of Alberta and media there by clean tech. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful to have the same happening in true clean energy where we see projects underway and we see how the battery has improved over 20 years and become more reliable, how we see um, jobs that have been created. Now, I know there's some of this um, out there, but I mean, a real ramp up. And with that ramp up, a real demand, and this is where I think advocate advocacy groups come in, a real demand for, um, to make sure every single Canadian has uh, access to clean energy and the right to that and put a number on that. Just as industry puts a number on what it wants for carbon and capture, put a number on what, it, what we need to make sure we can scale up rapidly for renewables and make that solution um, really sensible and prudent. And it will begin to um, do more than anything to undermine the quote unquote green oil narrative, which is very dominant right now. 
Great, thanks, Natalie. Yeah, and, and thanks also to Louise for putting some resources into the chat on the research that you're doing. And it looks like Canadians are getting clean energy is from uh, wind, sun, and water. And so I love the idea of that demand for uh, maybe going beyond clean energy, which can get a little confusing too. Sometimes people fit natural gas into that thinking that is, but like that every Canadian has a right to energy from wind, sun, and water and tapping into our values around uh, the natural world. Um, okay, I wanna go to a couple of the questions from uh, that we got in advance uh, from uh, those registered. And then uh, Amber and Marie are gonna send a few more over that have come in uh, recently. So there were a couple of questions that were related. One was how do we integrate the call for just transition into our communications? And there was another question around how do we find common ground with those who work in oil and gas. So um, Chris, I'm gonna to go to you and just see what are your thoughts on how we might uh, address those different themes? Yeah, I mean, well, one of the things I think that's really emerging is um, like if you're really talking about um, bridging and you know trying to get away from the polarization with um, workers who are working in fossil fuel industries now. Um, transition is probably not the right way to talk about it um, because, you know, there's what you say and there's what gets heard, right? And when I say transition, I um, envision, you know, a transition to clean electricity and a better future. If I work in the oil patch and I hear transition, I hear I'm losing my job. And um, so, you know, we know, for example, in Alberta, that things like diversification are much better ways to talk about it so that there's some sense of, you know, moving towards something that has um, a livelihood attached to it. Um, you know, just transition, I, you know, is, is actually, I think a, it, it's definitely the lingo. Um, it's not, I don't think in, I think it's loaded and it's coded as a, you know, a pretty hard progressive kind of um, yeah. value. Um, Canadians are really supportive of fairness. That's a foundational value across the country. Um, I think that's probably the, the, the value we wanna trigger is, is fairness. And, um, you know, one thing that you see even um, in the prairies is that everyone, whole everyone even you know oil and gas workers understand that the transition is underway right so it's about um painting a a, a pathway like when we're talking to the general public we want it, we're talking about painting a pathway towards clean electricity renewables um, electricity um generated by renewables and um where it's um for you know, oil and gas dependent communities in particular, I think it's um, it, it's really important to be talking about things like just transition, whether or not that's the right language, um, that people are going to get supported um, along the way, um, and and holding up you know the examples of um, jurisdictions that are diversifying and. Um, doing a better job. Okay, great. Natalie, do you want to add anything on to that? Yeah, I would say that's I'm in agreement big time with with Chris on the fairness um, value for Canadians. I think that's very, very key. I think just transition is very political language and it's fine to use that often in you know advocacy work and in, in media, but I'm not sure it's very resonant in places like the oil patch or wherever. And um, I think the way to to help um, because we don't want more disengagement from Canadians. I mean, it's a huge amount of disengagement when there's all this anxiety out there. So depending on your audience, you, you have to, you know, wordsmith and figure out the best approach. And I think when it comes to Alberta, for example, um, being very negative about the oil industry is just not the way to go. And um, being very negative about every option that they're putting forward is not the way to go. You can still 
be critical without, with also by, by being discerning. And I think that kind of messaging is, it sounds nuanced and like, oh, the average Canadian won't get it. But I actually think we're there. We are far more climate aware and educated than ever before. And so to be able to say, for example, rather than say all carbon capture and storage is terrible, no way this is, you know, and, and really come out strong, you know, to say, well, you know what, for some industries like cement, it may be the only option to reduce those emissions. So you sound like reasonable. And I think to sound more reasonable with, with the industry solution package while not agreeing with it um, and putting forward that, that other way more sensible because it's climate safe, renewable pathway is the way to go. Yeah, and I just maybe add just back on the fairness point. I mean, I think we can call out it's not fair to those who work in those industries to be left without a plan when we are moving away from oil and gas because of climate and health and all sorts of reasons. The alternatives are here. Um, and, you know, I would also say, and Amber knows far more about this than I do, but you know, Alberta is also becoming a renewable energy superpower, like for Canada, like that is expanding greatly. And so elevating what is actually underway in terms of the transition now, and what are the kinds of jobs, not the numbers, because that you can get into just a numbers back and forth, but who are in those jobs? What are those jobs like, you know, and you, you see that with the fossil fuel industry, oh, it's Karen so-and-so who went to University of Alberta and now has this great job <clears throat> working in the sector and feels has a great life and feels fulfilled, right? So we have to actually tell the stories of this change and, and uh, what those jobs are like and how to access them. Um, okay, let's go to uh, actually a question that's just come in. Uh, and thanks everyone for putting those into the Q and A. Uh, I think just uh, let's build out a little bit more on the terminology. Uh, there's question in particular around gas. We talked about earlier, it can be confusing because many people uh, think natural gas is clean because it's called natural. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if maybe Chris start with you some thoughts on terminology there. Yeah, well, I think that um, the key thing is to go back to that triangle and make sure, you know, you're hitting all the points in each of the communications. So you give people a full package, um, a full story. Um, so, you know, you want to be talking about clean electricity, right? So like, make sure that you sort of underline um, what the alternative is, what the vision is, where, where the path forward is natural gas is, I know it's like, it, it makes everybody um, in climate world crazy. And um, we do know in the US that methane gas tests um, best as an alternative. And you do see increasingly, um, you know, climate communicators um, using that language. I don't know of actual evidence in Canada of whether, um, People have tested and found that to be, you know, exactly um, the right term. You know, you see a lot of people using fossil gas, trying to make that stick as well. Um, you know, fossil fuel is something um, that people increasingly do understand and connect the dots about. So I think that um, in terms of gas, um, you know, talking about fossil fuel gas, talking about methane gas, it's useful um, so long as you know you're always hitting all those three points and um, and and um, making the case that the point is to remove, move to um, clean electricity powered by renewables, Great. wind Thanks and sun, <laughs> wind, sun, and water. All right, um, there was a question that came in about how do we address. Uh, the issue of liquefied natural gas in British Columbia. And um, again, expansion there being one of the sort of global problems if plans were to go through. Uh, and at the same time, the province is looking at increasing the price on carbon emissions. So Natalie, I'm just wondering your thoughts on how do we um, address LNG in British Columbia 
um, and it sort of role in the world. And how does that connect in with, again, it's sort of this contradiction, right? Of like doing a good thing, increasing the price on, on carbon while doing something that really goes against that. Well, first of all, call it fracked gas. I mean, that's the number one thing to do in BC is call it fracked gas every time you, you can. Um, it's very unpopular, that term as we know, and that's what it is. And it, um, so, I mean, there's a lot to say about LNG in BC. Um, I don't think there's a problem being able to um, commend a government for a strong um, move toward climate safety while also um, pointing out all the problems that exist still that need to be attended to. You know, just yesterday, um, that government passed Bill 21, which is astounding, which means that there's no oil and gas development on, on the territory. It's the first in the world. It's a hugely valuable, because it shows what can be done. It shows how provinces can move forward in, in, in moving off of fossil fuels. So I think we can sometimes in Canada get very focused within our own boundaries of, prov you know, our provincial boundaries, our municipal boundaries when we, when we often speak. But bringing in other examples from Canada can also really help show just how egregious something like LNG is. Um, so there's that. Um, it does not square with BC's climate plan. There's that. Um, then there's also just the reality of the economics. And again, it depends on your audience. So um, if you're speaking to, though to mainstream media, they're, very, they're increasingly interested in this topic and um, aware that, the, um, that so many LNG projects have not come to fruition because they are just so costly and they don't have a proven market. And that still exists in BC. So there's really one project that's gone ahead and many others that are being fought not to. Um, and it's, and it's really, I think, too, again, this sort of national context bringing it up high level. BC is doing a lot of great things. I mean, you just mentioned about the EV adoption. Show the hows, you know, the how, how Canadians are really adopting and adapting to climate, uh, to a new climate reality, while also pointing out what needs still to be done. And that's really LNG in BC is the number one problem, I would say, in BC. Okay, great. Um, Chris, I'm going to turn it to you for the last comment when we were preparing for this. Uh, you said something about we can't forget we're actually winning the narrative, even though there's a lot of really concerning trends. So I'm just wondering if you have any final thoughts you want to share before we turn it back to Amber to close us out. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we are. Um, as we all know, pro losing in terms of the atmosphere. And um, it is um, very bleak. And, um, you know, all that sort of 50% of the public um, in, you know, seeing doom, uh, it's not that they're crazy um, at all. Um, but what we do see from um, the public opinion research is that um, we are winning on the narrative. Um, it is moving in the right direction on um, several um, parts of the narrative. It's moving very quickly, you know, huge leaps just in the last couple of years. Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And, um, you know, I think the, the, one of the biggest worries is that the public leaps from, you know, apathy to despair. And, um, so it's really important to paint the picture of the pathway, not to fall into a self-fulfilling um, kind of cycle and prophecy. And um, the public is there um, and ready to um, sort of take the next step in terms of seeing that pathway painted out. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Natalie. It was really amazing you were able to join us today and thanks for sharing your insights. I really appreciate all of the resource sharing in the chat as well. So we'll, we'll pull that out and uh, uh, share out some of the links of research and various resources that folks were putting in there. Uh, so thanks again. And Amber, back to you for final words. Yeah, well, thank you everybody. We will share uh, this recording, the report, as Kara mentioned, we'll also share any of the resources that were mentioned um, in the chat. We'll also include our uh, contact information if you have specific follow-up questions or points that you would like um, to, to ask. 
we are very open to um, coming in, talking to teams, if that would be helpful. Um, so please do reach out. Um, and we're, we're really excited to be in this space and hopefully uh, here to support you um, in new and exciting ways over the next, uh, uh, over the next while. Um, when we close out the, the recording or out the, of Zoom, there will be a, a little survey. We need your feedback. We appreciate your feedback. So please do take a couple of moments to, to fill that out and let us know uh, what you think and um, what you need. So thank you everybody uh, for your time today. Thanks again, shout out to Chris, Natalie, Kara, and also Maria who helped and, and did a lot of heavy lifting on pulling together the, the polls and uh, the research that um, we'll be sharing with you shortly. So keep an eye out for an email um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys um, in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone.